Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session of our annual Energy Summit. Um, uh, very uh, privileged to be able to introduce Gretchen Watkins, um, who's going to join me for a, an armchair conversation to talk about, really build on uh, the stuff you just heard in Dave Turk's presentation. Um, Gretchen, it's good to see you. Um, rather than read a long uh, intro uh, about your many accolades, um, I think it'd be great, actually, if you could just kind of begin with, with telling folks about your background and kind of what brought you to Shell. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ken. And um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a little bit of an awkward uh, situation to not sort of see people in front of me, uh, but I can see Ken. Um, but but welcome, and uh, thanks, Ken, for inviting me to, to join you for uh, for this session. It's good to be here. Yeah, so I'm um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, got my degree about 30 years ago, actually this year, um, and uh, you know have been in the energy industry my entire career. Um, started working uh, in New Orleans as a facilities engineer for Amco and uh, had had an opportunity to spend a good amount of time offshore in the Gulf of Mexico then. Um, was with Amoco and then BP for about 18 years. Um, had a chance to live and work in a number of different countries around the world, which was great. Um, really uh, feel grateful for my time with that company. And then um, I joined Marathon here in Houston, so this is my second stint in Houston. I was with Marathon for about five years running uh, their international portfolio, and then I was in Copenhagen, Denmark, for five years. Um, I went over there uh, as the chief operating officer from Maersk Oil, and a couple years after that, uh, I was asked to take the CEO role for Maersk Oil, and um, did that uh, role until um, we sold ourselves to Total. Uh, back in 2018, and uh, it was at that point I found myself at a bit of a career crossroads that, frankly, maybe a year before that I hadn't expected to be at. Um, but I did, you know, look at a number of different things, going to be CEO of another company or um, or doing something very different. And in, in fact, I found a, I found a home here in Shell. Uh, I've been here for about two and a half years, and. And when I first uh, went to speak to the Shell team, um, you know, including Ben Van Burden and, and the CEO and his whole team, I was really quite struck by the, the strategy, um, which is you know still the same today as it was two years ago, uh, which is really having a world-class investment case, um, a strong license to operate in the societies that we operate in, but then having this thrive through the energy transition. And it really felt like um, that piece in and of itself uh, was what really attracted me. And Shell, I believe, is right on the front edge of this energy transition. And I felt like joining a company like Shell would help me be part of creating the future of energy, um, which is what I think we're doing um, in our company. And I think uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, energy behind you know, really being part of this, but also sort of leading through this, uh, this transition right now. So um, not only am I president of Shell in the U.S., I also run our global sales group. Um, uh, so that's uh, kind of a, a dual role that I have. Sure. Um, uh, we're going to come back to uh, your career path because uh, I definitely want to get back to your advice for students who we have a lot of actually uh, listening in uh, as they sort of think about their own career paths. But uh, we'll definitely come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, the topic of today's uh, conversation in, in the in, in the uh, energy summit more generally is really focused on resilience. Um, I wonder if you could just spend a couple of minutes to think about or, or, or comment on what resilience means to you and sort of uh, where you see it showing up in the strategy uh, of Shell and the work that you're engaged with. Yeah, so I mean, it's a it's a word that is used quite a bit, and I think when you think about um, resilience and as it pertains to sort of where we are um, as, a, a, as energy, as an energy industry, um, you know, hydrocarbons is still a big part of, uh, of the energy um, that we consume as consumers, that the world consumes. And so there's a big, still a big part of, of hydrocarbons, but we're going to see um, the resilience of that, um, I think, sort of changing as renewables becomes um, you know, more to the forefront. And I think there's also a big piece on, on resilience around controlling and containing our emissions, eliminating our emissions where we can. Um, but also then we get into things like carbon capture, which I know um, the speaker before me just uh, spent some time talking about, which, which at Shell we feel is a huge part um, of, our, of, the, of the energy transition and a huge part of our ambition as a company um, to hit the, the ambitions of Paris to, to keep the world within a, a degree and a half 
um, from a climate uh, warming perspective. You know, I think there's also um, a piece, a resiliency piece around having energy be not only reliable, but also affordable. And so um, when you think about um, our net zero um, emissions ambition by mid-century, um, that needs to also include a, a sustainability component so that there's access to that kind of energy, reliable, affordable energy for, for all. So I think there's a piece there around resilience. And then I, I maybe the last thing I would say is, is I think resilience also includes innovation. Um, and you know, not only from a technology perspective, in terms of climate, but also innovation preparing for our change in climate. So how do we protect our, our coasts and our cities? Um, so it's, it's sort of all of that together resilient. It's not just one thing. Yeah, that's interesting. You actually raised quite a few points there that, that I know we're, we're intimately engaged with here at Rice um, uh, in terms of thinking about resilience, carbon capture, uh, coastal resilience. Uh, there's a big program here at Rice focused on that. Um, lots of different uh, threads to pull there, but the one I want to kind of focus on, because you did mention the net zero ambitions that Shell recently announced. Um, and, uh, you know, Shell is also looking at, you know, the power sector becoming more of, a, of an energy company than just a traditional sort of big oil company. Um, uh, when you look at future planning and you think about building a resilient business model um, within Shell and across all the different Shell business units, um, I, I'm actually intrigued to, to, to hear you talk a little bit about what the path forward at Shell actually looks like, right? When you think about what that net zero future holds. I mean, we all know energy always transitions, right? So it's it's sometimes an, uh, a misnomer to talk about the current state of the world as if we've never been through a period where things were changing rapidly. But this time does feel a little bit different. Um, you know, the environmental motivation is certainly strong. We've got ESG pressures that are all of a sudden mounting. Um, and companies like Shell are taking, you know, making big announcements and taking big steps. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, earlier this year, we actually, you know, really amped up our commitments um, around net zero, and, and we committed to being a net zero um, uh, company by 2050 or sooner. Um, and, and, you know, that we had already put a number of sort of medium term and longer term um, targets out there or milestones out there, but we actually took those and made them even more aggressive. And so right now what we're saying is that um, by 2035, um, we're going to look at reducing the net carbon footprint of the products that we sell by 30%. Um, that's up from 20%. So we've gone more aggressive. And then by 2050, um, we're going to reduce the carbon footprint of the products that we sell by 65%. So why not 100%? Well, because we still very much see hydrocarbons playing a role, not as big of a role, but playing a role even in 2050. And so in order to be net zero, that means we need to look at um, if we have reduced by 65%, um, we still will have products we're selling that have a carbon footprint. So how do we offset those? Is it through carbon capture? Is it through nature-based solutions? And we, we think of that very much as um, something we'll be doing collaboratively with our customers. Um, I, I think it's, it's important, and I'll come back to that customer piece in a minute, but I think it's, you know, from there, I think it's also important to think about those targets. We've got a number of different ways we can go about achieving those. The first is you know, we're still, um, you know, unapologetically out there finding, developing, producing um, oil and gas. And um, while we'll be doing less of that um, as you look out for the coming decades, um, we still feel like we're you know, the safest, most reliable, lowest cost and best at that. And so while we do that, um, how do we create a, a zero emissions, um, you know, situation when we're doing that or lo the lowest possible emissions um, and then offset the balance? And so really looking at efficiencies and emission reduction and emission elimination. And then I think the second piece is, um, is what kind of products are we providing? Um, so, you know, right now we're providing products, um, the majority of our products are things like gasoline and jet fuel. Um, as we move through uh, time, 
those products should change to more low to no carbon type products. So renewable energies, power generated through solar, through wind, through, um, through hydrogen, um, and uh, biofuels. And so looking at the products that we offer to consumers, um, having a lower footprint. Um, and then I think the last piece is that sort of for things that we can't you know, that, that, that we can't offset or, or that we can't sort of capture, um, offsetting them in some other way. So that does involve carbon capture. Um, it does involve nature-based solutions. So kind of three things around really getting arms around emissions, really getting our arms around low carbon to no carbon product offerings, and then looking at offsets for the balance. Um, and in, in doing that, we see us, ha our, we see us having to have much stronger relationships with sectors. And so um, we're not kind of standing by saying, well, we hope that the uh, aviation industry will someday sort of come and ask us for, uh, for biofuels. We're actually partnering with companies to look at how can we drive um, the demand for biofuels more quickly and also be the supplier of those low to no carbon uh, type fuels. And so looking at this from a sector standpoint, particularly where you get to these very difficult to decarbonize sectors like aviation, like heavy transport. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the, the customer side of it because I know, you know, Shell, y'all have an active interest in hydrogen uh, with projects in different places around the world. Um, hydrogen came up in, in, in Dave Turk's remarks, um, but so did carbon capture, so did new technology, expansion of renewables. Um, and we sort of finished by talking about the need for investment. Right, it's a it's a big hurdle, and one of the things that many people have pointed to that presents a challenge to a rapid transition, uh, perhaps, is uh, COVID. So, what's happened over the last year has been, um, in many ways, just unprecedented. Uh, the dramatic drop in in the price of oil that we saw in April, hitting negative uh, for the first time ever, unprecedented volatility. Um, you know, talking about the uh, uh, dramatic reduction in demand for energy, uh, and then people sort of looking at this as an opportunity, if you will, to uh, really accelerate a transition uh, versus, well, we don't have the money to do this, so maybe we can't move forward. So I wonder if you could maybe comment on that and what you think, and more generally, Shell, how Shell views uh, the pandemic and the crisis created in terms of accelerating the transition. Yeah. So I think, um, and I, I did see the, the chart uh, that, that Dave showed that looked at sort of, we have two, two ways things could go at this point. Um, I, I do think that COVID has shined a light on um, the energy transition and climate change that uh, wasn't, be, wasn't as bright as it was before. Um, and so I think um, the world may have, um, we, more people in the world might be focused on it than it was before, but, but I don't actually believe it's a fix yet. <laughs> um, so we've got more people tuned into it. We took a ton of cars off the road. We took a ton of planes out of the sky. We saw emissions drop as a result. Um, but of course, that things will recover. Um, and I, I don't necessarily believe that, um, the world is ready to um, shift gears as quickly as um, as maybe we would hope, as, as certainly as I would hope. Um, but I do think that we're seeing, you know, I can say from where I sit in Shell, we're seeing some indicators that um, things will accelerate. Um, so, for example, we own um, uh, about about fifty percent of a company called Silicon Ranch. Um, Silicon Ranch is a solar company based out of Tennessee. And we have seen um, just over the course of the last eight months um, an increase in demand for solar power from, and this, this company mostly uh, powers um, industry and, and companies. It's a B, more of a B2B B than a B2C type of company. Um, but we've seen an increase just over the last 18 months as I think the world has sort of taken a pause and said, hmm, what can we do in this time actually to, to accelerate that? Um, similarly, we own um, a German company called Sonnen, which is a battery company. And we've seen, um, and, 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 you know, they do supply batteries for people's homes. So, um, you know, batteries that you can actually generate power, store it, and then use it um, in, in sort of the off, 
peak times if you've got solar or whatever you have sort of powering your your home. And we've seen um, sales of that actually go up quite a bit over the last few months. So there are indicators out there that things are accelerating, um, but we're still in a place where we don't believe it's just going to happen naturally. There's going to need to be more um, more sort of push out there, uh, like I mentioned to you about, you know, working with sectors uh, to, to really sort of look at kind of how we can work together to accelerate that. So that actually raises another, um, I think, interesting question. I think you can shine some some light on that would that would be of value to our viewers. I, I know, especially, um, you know, we we've talked a lot already about how things are different in different places around the world. Um, when we talk about the energy transition, you know, Dave said transitions. That's the language IEA likes to use because it's very different in different places. But a lot of that kind of links back to the capability of uh, various economies to finance transitions, to actually fund uh, the development of things that may be latest and greatest technologies in their, on their own soil when they might be more expensive. So uh, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on how Shell is viewing its global portfolio instead of you know, maybe some investments in, say, North America or Europe, and um, you know how it how it is planning to tackle that issue of, of of the dual goals of affordable energy as well as cleaner energy. Yeah, so um, it, it's a great question, and like I made a point of starting off with, we have um, you know very much in our sights, um, not just sort of a sustainable, um, but also an affordable piece. Um, and we made a commitment um, a couple of years ago, actually, that by 2030, um, you know, we would provide uh, energy to 100 million people that, that don't have it today, um, which is um, which is actually, um, you know, not maybe as impactful as, as as you might think it is, because when when you look at kind of the world, there's over a billion people in the world today that don't have access to energy, and there's another billion that have access to intermittent or um, unsafe uh, energy sources. And so there's 2 billion people in the world today that, that actually um, you know, need that access, that access to reliable energy. So we wanna play a big role in that. Um, and we've actually committed to doing that. Um, and I think uh, you know, one of the other things I would say is, is part of that is certainly technology. But another part of that is actually working with governments um, on setting the right framework for policy that encourages that kind of investment. Um, and so I'll give you an example. It's back here in the U.S., but, but um, it's, it's one that I'm sort of daily involved with. Um, you know, we don't have a price on carbon at a national level here in the U.S. And you, know, you were talking about CCUS, and, and I know um, uh, Dave did just before this. But you know, if we're really going to see a, a giant step forward happen on CCUS in this country, we have to have a price on carbon. Um, there is a lot of capital out there, I think, waiting to invest in projects that have, you know, a little bit of a return. <laughs> um, but if you if you can't kind of get a return on a project like that, you are you are we're missing an opportunity as a country um, and an industry. To really accelerate some of that um, that technology, the technology is out there, but bringing the cost down of that, and so we see some of that happening in other places. I think Europe's doing a good job. We've got you know a carbon market in South Korea that works well, and so we're taking the learnings of where we've been, where we've got gov governments providing that kind of structure for us, and trying to transfer them to places where maybe it would be impactful to have that. Yeah, it's interesting you just raised the price on carbon because we will be addressing that directly uh, on the last day of the conference. Um, yeah. uh, we'll have some discussion about uh, what that could look like and the impacts it could potentially convey. Um, certainly commercial viability is incredibly important for any, any technology. So uh, to the extent that that could help, it could help, help accelerate. And I think in that dimension, there are lessons 
to be learned for some of these new technologies that are needed um, from what we've seen with wind and solar over the last 20 years, just some yeah. of the support that's been given and how it's actually accelerated investment. So um, it's interesting you raise that. So we're, we're actually getting close to time. So I told you I would come back to your career path and uh, make a, uh, get you to make some comments about um, uh, opportunities for students. You know, I'm, I'm big on, on talking about, at least in my own experience with students, not just here, but in other places around the world, uh, when I guess lecture, um, it's not that they don't want to work in the oil and gas industry. It's not that they, in some cases, don't want to work in the coal industry or only want to work in a renewables industry. Uh, what I've actually noticed increasingly, because there are some students that want to fit a particular niche, but that's always been true. But what I've noticed in mass is they just want really interesting problems to solve. And the oil and gas industry is uh, really laden with a lot of interesting problems to solve. And I think over time has been pretty successful at addressing issues as they've arisen. Um, so going back to your own career path, starting out you know, as a mechanical engineer uh, and then moving from a technically focused uh, sort of uh, uh, a job to something that's more uh, strategic to where you are now, right? Sort of at the top of the top of the field, you know, how would you advise students who are stepping into uh, pursuing career paths in the energy sector? And, and where do you think the biggest opportunities lie? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question um, because I think our industry can be viewed, um, you know, sort of if you do sort of a black and white is almost, you know, it's kind of old school and it's, you know, really not going anywhere, or, you know, fossil fuels are going out of style. Um, and, and I think I, I tend to view it very differently um, and kind of back to why I joined Shell. I mean, I, I actually think the world is going through an extremely exciting time right now. Um, and, and it is, we are creating a future that looks very different than we look today. And it's happening around us today. So it's not like something that's gonna start next year or next decade, like it's happening today. And, and some of, I believe, this is one of the world's greatest challenges right now is like what does the future of energy look like and it's not just a technical challenge right it's not just you know how do we get carbon capture to be more affordable and how do we make sure we, we don't have any flares in the permian basin i mean that's important but it's also about you know what role do we play with the government and what role how do we work with these sectors I was talking about? How do we partner with airlines so that they actually do use biofuels instead of, and how do they get biofuels to a point where it's actually not more expensive? It's, it's the same cost as they have today or even cheaper. Wouldn't that be great? Um, you know, and so, you know, some of the things that I get really fired up about in, in, you know, in Shell in the U S is we're partnering with some companies that you would think are, you know, not necessarily our logical partners. We're partnering with companies like Microsoft, um, Facebook, Amazon. They all have their own net carbon footprint reduction targets that they've told their shareholders um, and society that they're going to achieve, just like Shell has. And they need companies like us that provide, you know, we provide, we're like the, the second or the third biggest power um, you know, marketer in North America, and a third of that power we provide is renewables. So we can help companies shape a portfolio of power consumption that kind of brings their their carbon footprint down. And so it isn't, um, you know, I can speak to the engineers because the technical challenges are out there. I can speak to the business people because the commercial partnerships are going to have to be very different than they have traditionally been to get there. And then I can speak to, you know, others, like people like me, like I love the sort of geopolitical, global um, nature of this. Everyone needs energy everywhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, to the point that, um, that Dave made, like I always say energy transitions, I don't always say that, but I get what he's saying. Like every, there's going to be multiple ways of getting there, depending on the relationship that energy has with that country or with that um community and and um so from from my perspective like why wouldn't you want to step into this space of energy right now because there's just so much possibility and um you know the people that are in this industry today we are creating the future um and uh there's going to be some things that go great and some things that we 
trip over, but um, it's I think it's a fun time to be uh, to be part of it. That's interesting. Um, in a nutshell, what you just said is is uh, creativity will be rewarded on many fronts. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's that's I wish I could sort of hit rewind sometimes and, and go back to the point where I was kind of just entering into my career path and uh, see the dynamism that exists in the energy space now. And, and, and it can be truly rewarding um, uh, along those lines. Um, you know, we. Uh, we certainly miss seeing each other uh, around the office here at Rice. I know from talking to you the other day that you um, you feel the same way about your colleagues at Shell, and um, I'm certainly hopeful that there will come a day sooner rather than later where we can all be in the same room together. Um, it is uh, incredibly rewarding to have, like I said at the outset of the conference today, uh, spontaneous conversations that sort of trigger new thoughts, um, and that's the one thing that I feel like I'm missing. But one thing I will say that you've done a successful job of in this uh, in this short time is uh, triggering some new thoughts that I hope some of my students in particular are going to take to heart and, and really uh, internalize as they as they uh, move forward with their own career paths. But um, we're up against it on time, Gretchen. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, uh, as always, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, stay safe and healthy, and hope to see you soon. You bet, Ken. Thanks so much for inviting me, and uh, thanks, everyone, for listening.